they loved in an unhealthy way. Rabbi Shimon showed us how to love in a healthy way. What's the story of Rabbi Shimon? Tonight's talk is called How to Stop Controlling and Start Loving. And uh, the topic was chosen because of the time of the year. What's the connection to the time of the year? Right now we're in the middle of Sphira, which is a time of minor avelos, mourning for the Jewish people. Because during this period of time, 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva perished in an epidemic, in a plague. And it seems astonishing that a great teacher such as Rabbi Akiva would have students who were worthy of death. And the explanation that the Gemara gives us is even more astonishing. The Gemara tells us that they were being punished because they didn't treat each other respectfully. They didn't give each other honor. So as I said, the explanation is even more astonishing. What was Rabbi Akiva's anthem? What was his banner? Rabbi Akiva is the one, famously, who said, Love your fellow as yourself. This is a major principle of the Torah. This concept of, of loving your fellow. So students of the man who taught love ended up incapable of treating each other respectfully. And maybe you're going to say, well, maybe they were just wannabes. They're Rebbe Akiva wannabes. You know, they were tagalongs. But no, we're told they are, they are Talmidei Rebbe Akiva. They are his Talmidim. They are his disciples. So what in the world went wrong? You know, our sages tell us that Ein Deyeseyem Shal B'nei Adam Shaves, that no two human beings have the same mind. Everybody's mind works differently. And accordingly, that means that however many students Rabbi Akiva had, that's how many different ways of being a student of Rabbi Akiva there were. So these 24,000 students were all students of one man, and yet they all had a little bit of a different perspective, being that each one of us is different. Now, what do I care if you think differently than I do? What does it bother me? You know, the Kotzker has a vort. The Gemara says, no, I mentioned before that no two people have the same mind. Actually, the full context of the, of the passage there, so the Gemara in Brachas, says that just like no two people have the same face, same parts of, same facial features, no two people have the same mind. So the, the Kotzker said, why does the Gemara compare the two? Why does it say it like that? Just say, no two people have the same mind. So he explained, if you meet somebody whose face doesn't look like yours, you meet somebody, they're not your identical twin, they're not your doppelganger. It bothers you, makes you mad. hey, how dare you look not like me? No, it doesn't even occur to you. So how come it's annoying when you confront somebody with a different way of looking at reality than you do? So really, it shouldn't bother us that somebody has a different way of seeing things. But here's the problem. Rebbe Kiva's students, they couldn't live with that. They couldn't abide by somebody else not having the same perspective as they had. You know why they couldn't abide by it? Because they loved each other. Not because of, not because of a lack of a love. Not because they didn't have enough of a love for each other. But because they had so much of a love for their fellow, they couldn't stand to see him be wrong. And that's what destroyed them. Of course, in their case, being very lofty, very righteous people, the judgment was more exacting. 
Hashem judges the righteous until a hair's breadth. But there's a lesson here for all of us. Sometimes what is the most destructive force in a relationship is not the lack of love, but the wrong type of a love, or the misdirection of the love. And that's really the story of the destruction of the demise of these 24,000 students. In fact, you might even say that not only did they get from Rabbi Akiva to love your fellow, but they picked up another uh, idea from him as well. Sacrifice. What was Rabbi Akiva known for? Sacrifice. We read about it on, on Yim Kippur and the Machzer and the Davening, about Hasara Haruge Malchus, about the ten martyrs. Rabbi Akiva was a martyr. Rabbi Akiva was the one who said that my entire life I was yearning for martyrdom. And then the Romans gave him the opportunity to do it. They took his life. So Rabbi Akiva was a martyr. Now, what do you get when you put together intense love for another and martyrdom? Love martyrs. Now in Rabbi Akiva, he was able to do it in the healthiest way. Rabbi Akiva was an exceptionally holy, holy is not even the word, um, divine man. You know, we say that there are ten martyrs. Why were the ten martyrs? Because uh, the, the evil king said it was a punishment for the ten brothers who kidnapped Yosef. Right? There were twelve brothers in total. Yosef was the victim. Binyamin wasn't there. But if you remember, Reuven had left. He didn't want to be part of it. So how did they have a minion? How did they have a tenth? They included a Kodesh Baruch himself in the pact. So the ten martyrs stood for the ten members of the pact. Rabbi Akiva was the one who represented Hashem's part in the deal. In other words, Rabbi Akiva was so holy, he was an embodiment, a representation of divinity. So in Rabbi Akiva, martyrdom and love coupled together did no harm, no harm at all. It was holy, it was healthy, it was wholesome. But in his students, it came out in a little bit of a dysfunctional way. And they ended up being love martyrs. What does that mean, a love martyr? I'm going to love you, I'm going to fix you, I'm going to make you the way I know you have to be, or I'm going to die trying. And there's a clinical term for that, by the way. You know what it's called? A Jewish mother. <laughs> by the way, the clinical term, by the way, is a codependent. I learned on one, at one moment I had an epiphany, and I realized that I could double my comedic repertoire in one moment when I realized that all of the codependent jokes they tell in recovery are identical with the Jewish mother jokes that the Jews tell, so you can just swap them, and then I doubled my comedic repertoire. Like, yeah, codependent jokes, Jewish mother jokes, the same, the same jokes. Like, how many, Jewish mother, how many Jewish mothers does it take to uh, screw in a light bulb? Don't worry about me, I'll sit in the dark. <laughs> or, um, codependent one. What's the last thing a codependent sees before he dies? Somebody else's life flashes before his eyes. Okay, so basically you're talking about somebody who says, Honey, I'm here for you, I'm going to fix you, my life is about you. I have no life, no, I don't deserve a life. My life's on hold because I'm, I'm taking care of you and, uh, and I'm going to die trying to fix you. And uh, it's painfully, painfully, painfully true. I mean, when I say I'm going to die trying to fix you, I don't, I don't mean it hy as hyperbole. And I don't know what the you know, medical examiners write down as cause of death when people go to their grave having put their entire life on hold trying to save somebody else from their own dysfunction. But it's a serious thing. It's not a joke. The misery, the living hell on earth I get a lot of calls, still, I get a lot of calls from people who are dealing with addiction in the family. I never asked for this. I never put, out, I never put up a shingle. I'm not an expert by any stretch. I wrote a book on addiction and recovery, but it's all chassidus, and I make it very clear that that's what it is. 
But nevertheless, I get a lot of calls. People call me with questions about addiction, and I try to send them to the appropriate help. 80% of the calls I get are not from addicts. They're from friends and family, or mostly family of addicts. And it's very difficult to answer a question to the person who's trying to fix somebody else's problem. But let me just tell you classically what happens. They'll call me up, they'll say we have a problem. It's my mother, my father, my wife, my husband, my son, my daughter, my brother, my sister, whoever it is. They're out of control. We tried this, we tried that, we went to experts, we spent all this money. We don't know what to do. What, what can we do? So, uh, I've had this call so many times, I've, you know, I'm used to it. What I've realized is probably the most efficient way to streamline the conversation is I ask, I ask a question. Because I know I can't give solutions to somebody about somebody else. So what am I supposed to tell the person who's calling? They're calling about somebody else, I'm supposed to... What, I can only offer the person who I'm talking to something that they can do for themselves. I can't offer you something to do for somebody else. You know, there's free choice, right? Free choice. Free choice is the freedom to choose your own behavior, not to choose other people's behavior. No matter how right you think you are. No, no matter how right you know you are. And even if a voice from heaven will come forth and, and confirm that you're right, your free choice still only extends to your own behavior. You can't, you can't choose how somebody else is going to behave, even if you're watching them spiral into destruction. So I asked the question. I asked them, let me ask you something. I'm sure that you're not calling me right now on a good day, right? You're picking up the phone, you're calling out for help, you're probably at a low point right now, maybe even the lowest so far. Probably a lot of insanity, a lot of drama going on right now, a lot of fear, panic, dread. And I say all of these things because I'm just, for a couple of reasons. One is I'm trying to let them know that I'm not minimizing the situation. I know how crazy it is. But secondly, I, I'm, I'm telling them to save time. Because every story is the same story. I mean, the, the, the details might be different, but the same story. The roller coaster, the, 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 the raised hopes, and then the crash, and then the, the disappointment and the betrayal, it's the same story every time. So, I say, I know you're going through insanity, through drama. Sometimes I call it the roller coaster. I know you're on a roller coaster. So my question for you is this. If there were a way that you could get your serenity back, get your life back, even if your loved one doesn't change, would you be interested in that? I'm going to ask you something. Let's say that I've had that phone call a hundred times. I would guess it's a lot more than a hundred, but for easy math, let's say that I've had that conversation a hundred times. How many times out of a hundred do you think the answer is yes? I'm interested. Let me hear about that. Zero. 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 I'd say, I'd say five. So, this is a realistic crowd over here. I heard zero and I heard five. I'd guess it's somewhere between zero and five, yeah. No, it's between zero and five. Yeah, it's not zero, no, it's a few. Maybe three or four out of 100. But 95, 96, 97% easily, easily will say to me, no, no, I'm not interested. No, that's not what I want. And even if you reiterate it to them, you know, just to make sure they understood the options. Behind door number one, I mean, I don't, mind, I, I don't mean to, to trivialize it. I'm not trying to be funny, but, okay. Option number one 
is you continue on the roller coaster, the insanity of trying to fix this person. And option number two is you get your life back, you get your serenity back, you get yourself back. And they say, no, no, I don't want that. Okay? So that's a love martyr. And it's no joke. People die from this. Like I said, I don't know what the medical examiner writes as the cause of death, but people die from this. They go to early graves from this. They drive themselves and their entire family and sometimes entire community insane. And it's not from a lack of love. It's from an abundance of love. The love that says, I know what's good for you, and I must make sure that that's what you get. I mean, it sounds so simple, live and let live. Live and let live. Sounds simple. But there's, it becomes an obsession. I call it being addicted to the addict. You know, just like the addict is obsessed with getting that next fix that makes you feel like life is okay. Life is okay, right? For a second, for however long the high lasts. So being addicted to the addict means there's that one moment where you feel in control, right? Where you, you know, you check their cell phone messages or where you <sighs> called someone who says, I saw where they are. Or you go through their, you go through their, their, their wallet while they're asleep. And whatever it is, the detective work that you have to play to, to feel like you have that control, like you're keeping tabs on them, like, you know, KGB stuff. You know what's happening. Oh, that moment, that illusion of, oh, they're safe. Oh, they're okay. Oh. And it's, and it's, it's being addicted to the addict. It's addicted to that feeling, that momentary, fleeting, false feeling that everything's okay, everything's under control. When the truth is, no. It's not under control. I mean, not under your control. It's under God's control. And the recovery from this obsession, this addiction to the addict, is to detach and release that person to the loving care of God, who is in control. You know, they say detach is an acronym. D-E-T-A-C-H, detach. Don't even try and change him or her. Let go. And let go is not abandonment. Let go is let go of expectations. A lot of people I hear, they get so burnt out they become hardened, their hearts become hard. And then they say, well, you know what? I was a people pleaser, and now my, my recovery from being a people pleaser is I have to be a jerk. They don't say I have to be a jerk, but well, sometimes they do, actually. But they, you know, no, I have to say no. It's toxic for me to say yes. And, and that's unfortunate, because what was doing harm was not the kindness. It wasn't that you were being kind to someone. It was that you were being kind in exchange for the illusion of control. The kindness wasn't really gratuitous kindness. It wasn't for fun and for free. The love was a manipulative way of feeling like I can assure myself that this person is going to behave the way I know that they need to behave. Yeah, every single time, 100%. By the way, never believe a categorical statement. No, but enough of the time. It's all, everything's on a spectrum. Everything's on a continuum. The question is, how far, how far along the continuum are you? And that, of course, is for each person to examine in consultation with someone who's objective, a spiritual guide, someone who knows your life. And sometimes we really do reach a place where our motives are clean and we can give lovingly with no strings attached. Rabbi Akiva was able to do that. His students weren't. 
We can aspire to it. But to the extent that we're lacking and that we're still controlling instead of truly loving or using love manipulatively to control, then we should be aware of it. We should be aware of it and we should consciously try to cut it out. Stop it. Let go. But I'm not here to tell you all about the problem. I, wa I also want to talk about the solution. So as we know, this time of year, the, uh, the, the Sphira is the time of mourning for the 24,000 students who perished. But there was a respite from that, uh, that epidemic. And the date when the students stopped dying was Lag Bo'emer, the 33rd day of the Oimer. Now Lag Bo'emer, the 33rd day of the Oimer, is also famous for another reason. It's the Yem Hilula, the yurt site of Rabbi Shimon ben Yechai, the great Tana, the author of the Zohar. What's interesting, though, is that Rabbi Shimon ben Yechai is connected to this date in two different ways. One way is, we mentioned, that, that this day itself is his yurt site. But another way is that as we mentioned, the students of Rabbi Akiva stopped dying on Lag Boimer. So after the 24,000 24, students died, Rabbi Akiva, who lived to 120, Rabbi Akiva started to learn Torah at 40, he studied until 80, and he taught until 120. So he started from scratch, and he raised up five disciples, great Tanoim, great Chachomim, one of whom was Rabbi Shimon ben Yechai, who was his star pupil. To the extent, what do I mean by star pupil, that Rabbi, Rabbi Shimon once asked Rabbi Akiva whether he was pleased with him because he showed certain recognition to the other students. And uh, Rabbi Akiva told Rabbi Shimon, it is enough that your creator and I recognize your greatness. Meaning to say, not even the other students could recognize his greatness. They were incapable of fathoming his greatness. So Rabbi Shimon was the, was the uh, pupil par excellence of Rabbi Akiva. And in Rabbi Shimon we find the ultimate expression of healthy love. We find the ultimate tikkun and rectification of that which destroyed the previous group of students. They loved in an unhealthy way. Rabbi Shimon showed us how to love in a healthy way. What's the story of Rabbi Shimon? We know that he lived in a time of persecution. where It was very dangerous to be a Jewish leader. And Rabbi Shimon was not... Uh, he did not speak in a flattering way about the Romans. And they came looking for him to execute him. So he hid for a while. Ultimately, that wasn't safe. He went to a cave. He and his son, they stayed in the cave for 12 years studying Torah. They came out after 12 years, and uh, at first they were shocked because their entire life was Torah. They didn't work, obviously, living in a cave. They didn't work, didn't have jobs. How did they feed themselves? Miraculously. There was a carob tree, there was a stream or a, a well. So they were completely separate from day-to-day -day mundane concerns. They were living in a totally spiritual life. And they came out, and at first they were shocked. They saw people farming, and it was just too much for them. They, they couldn't take it. And they started, everything they looked at, they were burning with their eyes. So they heard a voice, go back in, go back into the cave. So they went back into the cave for another year. After they came out, after the 13th year, something changed. Rabbi Shimon's son, Rabbi Lazar, he saw somebody farming, and he was, he was shocked. Rabbi Shimon told him, no, 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 it's okay. He says, it's okay, don't worry about it, son. It's enough for the world that there are two like us. 
What did he mean by that? He meant, we're unusual. We study Torah, we do nothing but study Torah. We're completely spiritual. That's not the standard by which you can judge other people. Don't use your standard to judge others. Live and let live. They don't have to be like us. It's enough that we are like us. Let them be how they are. Let each person be the best that they can be the way they can be. So that was the first thing. That was the first level of rectification. Live and let live. You know, there's what not to do and there's what to do. And when you're trying to uh, come back from dysfunction and drama and discord, first thing to deal with, first order of business, is the not doing. The not doing. Not the doing, the not doing. In other words, the sage advice to the codependent is, don't just do something, sit there. It's counterintuitive. Everybody thinks, don't just sit there, do something. No, 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 no. Don't just do something, sit there. Breathe. You forgot how to breathe. You were so busy controlling this person. You were so busy worrying for them. You were so busy living their life instead of your own. You forgot how to breathe. You forgot how to let go. Just be silent. We don't always have to have a solution. We don't always have to know how to fix things. That's the fatal flaw of the love martyr or codependent is that I always have to do something. I always have to, I always have to fix everything. I have, to, I have to fix everyone. Can't just let things be. You tell a joke about the addict, the alcoholic, and the codependent who were all on a on an island full of savages, and they were sentenced to death. And uh, the way that they committed the execution over there is with a guillotine, you know, French Revolution style. So <clears throat> the first one up was the, uh, the addict. He gets up to the, uh, on the platform and puts his head down in the chopping block, and they pull this rope. The executioner pulls the rope, and this blade goes up, you know, 20, 20 feet into the air. And uh, then the executioner lets go of the rope, and the blade starts whizzing down the track, plummeting toward the uh, addict's neck. And all of a sudden, it jams in the track. And uh, the executioner looks at the addict, and he says, this is the law of our land. We consider this an act of God. You are free to go, live, and be well. Next one up. The alcoholic gets up there, says, put your head down there in that block. Puts his head in the guillotine. Executioner pulls that rope. Blade goes up 20 feet into the air. Executioner lets go, the blade comes whizzing down the track, and just a millimeter above the alcoholic's neck, the, the, the blade jams in the track, it's just hanging there, not touching him. And the executioner says to the alcoholic, this is the law of our land, we consider this an act of God, you are free to go, live and be well. Next, the codependent gets up on the stage, on the platform, looks at the guillotine, looks at the executioner, taps him on the shoulder and says, you know, I think I know how to fix that. <laughs> so the first rule is just stop you don't always have to be busy you don't always have to have a solution you don't even have to have something to say so the first lesson was Rabbi Shimon comes out of the, the cave and he tells his son, it's cool, it's good, just let it go. Let people be who they are. It's enough that we are who we are, let them be who they are. And that's the first thing, the not doing, the letting go. All right. Now you want to talk about what to do after you have after you have sufficiently stopped doing all of the things that are just exacerbating drama. And let me be clear, all of the things that are exacerbating drama are all well-intended, they're all meant with love. This we know, we know this. 
But the love martyr or the codependent needs to just stop, let go. You know the story about uh, Yosef and Binyamin? Yosef and Binyamin didn't see each other <clears throat> all those years. And they have this tearful reunion. They're reunited and they, they hug each other and they, and they fall on each other's neck and they cry on each other's neck. And there's that Rashi there. Rashi says that the neck represents the, the Beis Hamikdash, the holy temple or the, or the, the sanctuary, the tabernacle. And uh, prophetically at that moment, Yosef was seeing how in the future, the descendants of Binyamin were going to suffer a calamity that the holy temple, which was built in the territorial home of Binyamin, that's where the, the Beis HaMikdash was in the property or in the territory of, of Binyamin, that the holy temple was going to be destroyed, which was in the portion of Binyamin. So Yosef was crying for that. And Binyamin saw, conversely, that the, in many generations later, the descendants of Yosef, they would have the Mishkan Shiloi, the tabernacle or the sanctuary in Shiloh or Shiloh, which would also be destroyed. And he was crying, Binyamin was crying for that, for that calamity that was going to happen to the descendants of Yosef. So the question is, if each one had an impending calamity, many generations henceforth, why were they crying only for the others? And you could say compassion, Okay, so cry for the other one as well. Empathy doesn't mean that you don't also feel your own problem. But it's a deep, it's a deep lesson. What's crying? Crying doesn't do anything. Crying doesn't change the situation. And yet sometimes you need to have a good cry. You have a good cry the situation hasn't changed at all, but there's something cleansing, there's something cathartic about the cry. Sometimes someone you love is going through pain. They're not asking for help. They're not capable of taking help. You know what's right for them. You know what they should be doing, but you can't do anything, so what can you do? You can cry. You sit down, open up a, a, a Tehillim, and, 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 and choke out the words, and, 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 and weep, and cry. Now, if you're the one facing your own calamity, if it's your path that's leading to destruction, do you cry? No, God forbid, don't cry. Take action, do something. If it's your problem, then fix it. It's the exact opposite rules. If it's the other guy's problem, he's got to fix it. You know, the Medrash says about the Pasuk, He said to me, offer kumi. Arouse yourself from the dust and stand up. Talking about the Jewish people in Gaulus. So the Medrash says that a rooster, if it falls in the soot, in the ashes, then a thousand people with a thousand tiny combs will never get that rooster clean again. But if the rooster himself gives himself one vigorous shake, then he'll become clean in an instant. So Yes and Binyamin were very healthy in their love for each other. And they were healthy in their relationship with themselves. For their own impending problems, they didn't cry, they took action, whatever they could do. But for the others, what can you do but cry? So that's the first thing. First thing is what not to do, to know your limitations. All right, now what to do? I keep dragging this one out. Everyone wants to hear this. Okay, what can I do? What are you, what are you gonna let me do? What's healthy? What's okay to do? It also says that a person has cups on them. They can't un themselves. Right. In Chovesh Matras Atzmai, the person who's locked can't release himself. That yeah. says that as well. That's why you need Hashem. When you can't fix someone, you're not abandoning them. I know a lot of parents have this problem because biologically we're wired 
with that maternal instinct or paternal instinct. And it's the hardest thing in the world to realize that God has no grandchildren. We think, because we're Hashem's children, and our children are our children, so then, you know, that's, that's the next generation. So our children are Hashem's grandchildren. It's not so. Your child is Hashem's child. And your child has their direct relationship with Hashem. And you have to be respectful of that. And sometimes when they need space, and you give them that space, that's not abandoning, that's allowing them to have their own relationship directly with Hashem, and you're not going to interfere. I'll tell you a personal story, but it's not, whatever, it is what it is. But I remember this very, very, very clearly. I was three and a half. How do I know it was three and a half? Because we were in the house that we moved to when, we, when, when I was three, and it was a little bit after we moved. Maybe I was four. And I remember standing on the green carpet, the shag green carpet, which was very uh, stylish in the 70s, a child of the 70s. And uh, I don't remember what I was upset about, but I remember being absolutely full, brimming with rage. And I remember looking out the back window. It was a sliding glass door, you know, those walk-through doors that go to the backyard, go to the back patio. And I just remember being so beside myself that I was shaking. And I don't remember what it was about. I was three and a half, whatever it was that you know, a three and a half year old could be that upset about. And I remember my, my mother coming over to me and saying to me, what's wrong, sweetie? Can I help you? And I remember distinctly telling her, no, you can't help me. This is between me and Hashem. And to her credit, she turned around and she left the room. It was decades before I understood the superhuman strength that it took that woman to turn around to honor that three and a half year old's request to be left alone with God. But I can tell you now, 40 some years later, that that's one of the greatest things she ever did for me. You know, Lag Ba'emer in Sphira is Hoid Shiba Hoid. What's Hoid? What's Hoid? You have Chesed and you have Gevura, that's the right side and the left side. So Chesed is love and Gevura is withholding. So that's the go and the stop, you know, the gas and the brakes. And then beneath Chesed and Gevura, you have the same paradigm, again, the right and the left axis, except it's Netzach and Hoyt. So Netzach is victory, marching forth to victory. Netzach is tenacity, stubbornness. We're going to do it. We keep going. We keep pushing. Hoyt is hold back, give space. Hoyt is poise. Poise. When you know how to stay quiet, how to make yourself small, how to hold space for an other. Hoid is poised. Lag boimer is hoid shiba hoid. Hoid shiba hoid. That means hoid squared. Poise within poise. Giving space and really giving space. Not giving space mixed with any other emotional coloring, but just giving space. And it comes from a profoundly faith-based premise of reality. Because a secular point of view says, you are abandoning the person regardless of what you try to convince yourself. But if you believe in God and a personal God, and a God who's personal to your loved ones, your children, your spouse, your parents, your siblings, and, and, and seven billion people on the planet, giving space means I'm allowing you to work this out with God. Hoid Shiba Hoid.
Okay. I mean, but again, that's the not doing. Can we talk a little bit about the doing, the healthy doing? Now, I'm glad that I stretched out so long the not doing because really that's the hardest part because <laughs> that, that's, that's, you know, the, 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 the old story about the guy who he says, I ran away from honor my whole life. It says that if you run from honor, it'll chase you. But I ran from honor and, and it never caught me. And the rabbi tells him, because you were always looking over your shoulder to see if the, the honor was catching up. So, you know, there's giving space and looking over your shoulder. Like, is this enough space? <laughs> It's not giving space. So I'm glad, I'm glad that we emphasize this point at length. Okay, but once we're giving space, once we're being respectful, how can we give in a healthy way? So let's continue the story of Rabbi Shimon. Comes out of the cave, tells his son, son, don't worry about it. It's enough to wear this way. Let everyone be their own way. And then he says, Since Hashem did a miracle for me, let me go. Azil, I'll go. Askin, I'll fix Milsa something. Let me go fix something. No, no, pay attention to that. Let me go fix something. Not let me go fix someone. There's a world of difference. Let me fix something. He came to a town. He said, Is there, are there any problems over here? Anything that needs fixing? They said, uh, we're pretty good. He says, no, but really anything. They said, well, yeah, we want to know. I mean, we have this little issue. There's a place of Suffolk Tuma. There's an unmarked graveyard. And uh, not an unmarked graveyard, but a place where bodies, a body, or perhaps more than one body, but there's a place where there, there, there's known to be Tumas Mess, a corpse, and um, we don't know exactly where it is, and it causes an inconvenience for the Kehanim in the town because it's right through, you know, where everybody walks, and so they have to take this circuitous route to get around the, to get around the town. So Rabbi Shimon says, okay, great, yeah. Let me, let me take care of that for them. And he did this whole thing where he identified where the bones were and he marked it off and then the Kehanim could basically walk straight through and just you know, walk immediately around the problem areas and it saved them, saved them a lot of inconvenience. What's the difference between fixing somebody and fixing something? Fixing somebody Besides the fact that it's a fool's errand, because you can't make somebody do, like I said before, a free choice means you choose your behavior, not someone else's. You can't make somebody do what they don't want to do. So besides the fact that it's a fool's errand, it's inherently arrogant. Let me fix you? Let me fix you? Like, how insulting is that? As opposed to what? Let me fix something. Let me fix the situation. You know, they say about marriage. It's not me versus you. It's me and you versus the problem. Huge difference. I'm not here to fix people. But I'll fix a problem. I'll fix a situation. But we don't fix people. People are perfect. How can you fix a perfect person? <laughs> no, I, I honestly mean it. People are perfect. They don't need to be fixed. Situations need to be fixed. Let me ask you a question. You're a Jewish man, put on tefillin in the morning, you finish shachris, you wrap up your tefillin, you put them away. Will you touch your tefillin again until tomorrow? Well, mitzat arvus, by virtue of the concept of guarantorship, technically, if you know there are Jewish men that you will meet through the day and have an influence over, 
and they haven't put on tefillin, you're actually obligated to touch your tefillin again after you've finished discharging your own personal obligation. You do have an obligation to touch your tefillin again so you can put it on somebody else. But here's the point. When you go over to somebody and you put tefillin on, on them, you're not fixing them. I'm not fixing you. I'm not making you better. I'm not improving you. Again, you can't improve on perfection. I'm fixing a situation. There's a situation here. What's the situation? It's called ignorance and apathy. It's called assimilation. There are Jews who didn't put on tefillin. Maybe because they don't know about it. Maybe because they don't care about it. Maybe because they don't care enough to remember. And if I have the ability to put a dent, even a little dent in that problem, I'm going to do it. But not because I'm fixing people. I'm not here to be your fixer. Remember a few years ago, by now it's got to be, I don't know, may, may, maybe by now it's 10 years ago. You know, the older you get, <laughs> your sense of time speeds up. They say life's like a roll of toilet paper. The closer you get to the end, the faster it goes. <laughs> so if I say something was three years ago, I have to remember it's probably 10 years ago. So it was probably 10 years ago. There was this very, very famous actress from TV and she was on a very famous talk show. Don't ask me who she was and don't ask me what the talk show was, I'm not sure. But I remember seeing the clip that was going around among shluchim. This lady, she basically, she's a Jewish woman, and she says how her 15-year-old son went to the mall and uh, he had his bar mitzvah at the mall. And the interviewer was saying, what it was a bar mitzvah at the, at, at, at the mall? What is that? Well, he was walking through the mall and these guys with beards and hats, they came over and I'm thinking, wow, you know, this is a story about Chabad, right? So these guys with beards, he was at the Beverly Center in L.A. If everyone knows where Beverly Center is, big mall on uh, La Cienega. So uh, they came over and they said, excuse me, are you Jewish? Yes. Have, have you ever put on tefillin? No. Oh, then today's your bar mitzvah. And they put tefillin on him. And, uh, and the, the interviewer was like, just like that? Yeah, just like that. And she says, it was a drive-by bar mitzvah. And the crowd cracks up, whoa, drive by, by, drive by bar mitzvah. And I remember at the time, the shluchim were discussing, you know, whether this was a clip that, you know, you should share with people, you know, with people who are, obviously, people who are all, all, already watching these shows and would, you know, care about that. So the discussion, well, it, well, maybe it's not a nice thing, a drive by bar mitzvah, it sounds kind of flippant, it sounds kind of glib, you know, oh, but on the other hand, tefillin, and he put on the tefillin, he, he was moved by it, he came home, he even told his mother about it, mitzvah gereres mitzvah, maybe it'll lead to something else, and there was a whole discussion about it, and I don't remember how it concluded, but what made a big impression upon me was the incredible poise, the incredible respect of, I'm just here to facilitate a Jewish experience and then disappear. You don't owe me nothing. That, that's when you know it's really giving. It's really for fun and for free. Real altruism. I'm here to offer you something that's good for you. You don't owe me anything. I'm offering an opportunity. I'm making it available. If you say no, no hard feelings. If you say yes, you're not indebted. I'm just here to offer something that will make the situation better. How many times do we see where human Emotions get mixed in with religious exchanges. I mean, it's almost impossible for it not to happen to some degree, and often it happens to a, to a toxic degree, where human emotions get mixed into a religious interaction or experience. I saw a bumper sticker once, it was a good bumper sticker, it said, Oh Lord, protect me from your followers. <laughs> Okay, because the person who thinks that they've got a religious license, you know, God himself has authorized that they 
are right. You know, they have that moral high ground that there's nothing more, nothing more arrogant, nothing more toxic. So we got to keep the humility. We got to keep the humility. The humility is, I'm not here to fix you. I'm here to fix a situation. There's a problem in the world, it's called apathy, ignorance, assimilation. I'm going to try to put a dent in that problem by offering a Jewish experience. I hope you'll take from it. If you don't take from it, no hard feelings. If you do take from it, you don't owe me anything. And, 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 and the truth is, that's not just the way it works, you know, when we're doing a religious favor, a spiritual favor for a, for a Jew that you've never met. That's the way it even works in, 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 in families, or it should work in families, in intimate relationships. When I do you a favor, it's not a secret, it's not secret barter, where I'm trading kindness for some type of control over you. You know, somebody does something sweet for you, and then the next day you get an, 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 an invisible invoice. You don't even realize that you're indebted. And then, then they, they, they get frustrated with you. And you don't even know why. You didn't know about the economy. You know, the, the, the stroke economy. Every, every, every validation is a stroke. So one stroke is worth another stroke, 20 strokes worth 20 strokes. I did this for you, now you owe me that. That's not love, that's control. And if you have a religious excuse to underwrite your love of people, then it becomes toxic control. You have to play shadchan. You're not God, you're just the matchmaker. And each individual has their own relationship with God Almighty. Healthiest, healthiest, healthiest exchange between two human beings that I ever saw in my life was in a Chabad house, I won't tell you where it was, somewhere on the East Coast, that's specific enough, it doesn't matter, it's irrelevant, I'm sure, and you'll tell, you can tell from this story that if I would mention who it was, the person would be very pained. But the story is like this. I'm in the Chabad house, I was brought out to speak, I spoke at the Kiddush, after I finished speaking, basically everybody leaves, now it's, you know, it's like 1.45 p.m. On a, on, a, on a Saturday. So at that point, I can tell who is keeping Shabbos at this point and who's not. Right? It becomes very clear at 1.45 on a Saturday at a Chabad house, after the Kiddush and the speech, who's got you know, karate practice or soccer or you know, a beauty shop appointment. Or whatever, you know, the people who are you know, looking at their watch and, and, and they're running. Right? There were a few people who stayed behind. You could tell they were in a Shabbos dick mode. And uh, one of them was sitting near the shliach. And it was clear that this guy was, was keeping Shabbos. And he says to the shliach, he says, and I didn't even hear the conversation leading up to it. I was distracted with something else. I just overhear him say one line. He says, Rabbi, really just, again, a thank you for changing my life. And I see the shliach react like, like someone had just slapped him in the face. Like, like shock, stun. And he's quiet for a minute. And then he sort of like gets himself together and says, No, no, no. I didn't change your life. And don't thank me. I want to thank you for allowing me the privilege to be there with you while you were changing. I thought that was the healthiest reaction I'd ever seen between two human beings. Thank you for giving me the privilege, the schus. What does it say? Megalglin schus al yedei zakai that Hashem makes good things happen through good people. The good thing was going to happen. This guy was going to go on a spiritual journey and he was going to grow. It was going to happen. You had a merit, a privilege, that you got to play a role. You didn't make it happen. It was happening from, that was between God and this person. You had a schus and schus 
is related to the word zichuch, which means refinement. In other words, you had the humility to be a transparent conduit to allow the godliness through you, and you didn't block it by mixing in your own ulterior motive and your own ego and your own expectations or your own sense of entitlement. You just stayed humble. You have that hoid, that poise, and you allow the goodness to come through. looking at the time. I need to have some uh, poise here and uh, control myself. <laughs> so I'm going to leave you with one vort. I'll leave you with one vort and it's related to Pirkei Oves, which we learned Pirkei Oves during this time of year. It says that Shnayim Sheyeshvim, two people who are sitting, Ve'en b'neihem divrei toira and there's no divrei teira between them. That the shechina is not shruya, the shechina, Hashem's presence, doesn't dwell among them. What does that mean? It means that two people can be engaged in a vertical relationship or in a horizontal one. And that makes all the difference. You see, in a vertical relationship, it's very clear who owes whom, who's superior to whom, who the fixer is, right? And that's the toxicity of the moral high ground of the codependent or the, the love martyr. Which is why it's so hard to ever let go of that obsession. Because, I'm only trying to do the right thing, right? It's, it's an obsession, you can't let go. I'm only trying to do the right thing. I'm only trying to help. But when it's a vertical relationship, when you're lording it over the other person, even when you try to put in toito, you try to make it, you use, you use God as your excuse. There's no shechina, there's no divine presence there because one Jew is standing over the other. When is the Shekhinah present? Only when there is an equality. So that's what the Mishnah says. When the words of Torah are not between them, in equality, in a horizontal relationship, then there's no God. But if they will be there in brotherhood, in mutual respect, and in, in, in a spirit of God has no grandchildren and we're all on one level. And we have a schus to be helpful to each other once in a while. Then the Shekhinah is there. So let's love each other without controlling each other. And uh, ultimately let's fix the ultimate situation that needs to be fixed. Like Rabbi Shimon said, that in the Golis, in the exile, Shkinta Begolosa, Hashem Himself is languishing in the exile. And that's the major situation that needs to be fixed through our interpersonal relationships. When they'll be healthy, the Shkinta will be healthy, the world will be healthy. All right, Rabbi Shays Taub here. I hope you enjoyed that video, but I want to share something more with you. In that lecture, we focused on all types of relationships. I want to get focused on parenting. If you're a parent and you want to figure out how to really love your child selflessly and be there for your child in a really healthy way, I want you to watch this video where we hone in on that. It's a difficult skill to master, but it's the greatest thing you can do for your child.